Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Word of the Lord reads, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this, I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy and erring and infallible word. Um, you know, I was having a conversation recently with a dear godly cousin um, of mine, and we were just talking about life and how life has a um how the Lord has a way of using life to sharpen our focus um and recenter our focus on him and he uses trials and highs, lows, peaks, valleys to sharpen our focus. And um in that conversation, of course, I won't share all of it because it was a private conversation between two cousins. But one of the things that was really notable to me that just kind of resonated deeply with me and I've been reflecting on it since we had it, um, was my cousin mentioned um, the following words saying, I'm too busy to pray or rather God is showing me that I'm not too busy to pray. God is showing me he wants me to do business by praying, by listening to him and by obeying, not grinding and not hustling. God wants me to do business by praying. That resonated with me because oftentimes we do use the excuse that I'm too busy to pray or I'm too stressed to pray. I'm too tired to pray. I don't have time to pray. But what if we were to uh, shift our focus and instead of saying I'm too busy to pray, say I'm too busy not to. I'm too tired not to. I'm too stressed not to. And I don't have time, so I must. Um, what if we made prayer our business rather than making all the other things in life our business. You know, um, when you first get your laptop or you first get your phone and you go to the internet for the first time, it has a default application that it uses. If you're a Microsoft person, you go to the internet, it's going to use Microsoft Edge as the default. I'm not a Microsoft Edge web browser guy. I like Google Chrome. But in order for me to use Google Chrome, I have to change my default settings because if I just say I want to go to the internet, it's going to automatically open up the Microsoft Edge application. There's some applications on your phone the same way where you say, hey, I want to do a search. And if you do that search, it's going to default to certain applications to open rather than the application that you might choose. And I think when it comes to life, there's like default settings that we have. That when we're stressed, when we're burned out, uh, when we're angry, when we when we feel wounded, when we feel hurt, uh, when we see others in stress and turmoil, there are certain defaults that we have. But I, I'm curious as to whether or not if you were to do inventory on your own life, would you find that your default was prayer? Would you find that if you stripped everything else down in your life, do you default to prayer when life is lifing, as the young folks would say? When trials, when tribulations, when peaks, when valleys are happening, do you default to prayer? You know, in this passage, Paul has given us several things to reflect on. He's giving us frequency of prayer, tells us that we should pray at all times. And and that doesn't simp that doesn't simply mean that, you know, if that 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on your knees. Uh, but it means that there is a going and coming sort of uh, posture that we live in, a, 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 a sort of mindfulness on God that we are constantly seeking his face, whether we're in the car and driving and there's and there's moments of solitude and silence. Maybe there's opportunities for us to seek the face of the Lord there. Uh, maybe during the day when we are in the middle of a of a of a of a low. There's moments for us to seek the Lord there. 
Or also when you think about all times, it's not just simply in our daily routine, having this kind of posture and this mindfulness to be constantly praying to God. But it's also at all times when you think about the seasons of life. You know, there are times in which when we are at our highest, prayer is at its lowest. And then when we are at our lowest, we're really crying out to God saying, God, you got to come through, please, please, please. Well, how about if prayer was more so just the way we lived our lives? When our seasons were fruitful, we were praying prayers of thankfulness. Maybe we didn't have much to ask God for, but maybe we could thank God for all the things that he's doing. But then when our seasons were more famished, we could pray that God would provide our daily bread and provide for us as needed. But there are never there are never seasons in which prayer is not needed because prayer is ultimately it's an announcement and an, and prayer is an acknowledgement. Prayer is an, an, an announcement of our neediness. We are all needy and we have needs that are seen and we have needs that are unseen that we don't even realize that they're present, but we need God. And prayer is also not, again, just an announcement, but it's an acknowledgement that our needs are only being met by God. Those unseen needs and those seen needs are ultimately only being met by God. And when we pray, we are acknowledging and announcing God, only you can fix what is wrong in me and what is wrong in the world around me, what is wrong in our churches, what is wrong in society. And only you deserve the credit when it's working, when it is going good, when it is, when it is fruitful, when we are bearing produce, you deserve the credit and you deserve the glory. Thus, my prayer life reflects that. Um, But Paul doesn't just talk about frequency of prayer. He talks about manner of prayer in the spirit, pray at all times in the spirit. What does that mean? It, well, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually deeper and more significant than the debate that we would have as as charismatics and, and Presbyterians and Baptists as it relates to praying in a spiritual language. But prayer in the spirit actually is deeper than that. You know, for one, it means praying in submission to the spirit of God, sort of what we see in the garden when when Jesus is praying, not my will, but thy will be done, praying in the spirit is a way to say, Lord, I want to pray your will. And I want I want to pray in line with where you want me to pray and where you want me to be and where you want your people to be. But then also we see in Romans 8, then when you talk about praying in the spirit, you're talking about praying in a way that acknowledges your weaknesses. Romans 8 verse 26 and 27 says that the spirit helps us in our weakness that when we are too weak and we don't know how we ought to pray, that the spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. In other words, in ways that cannot be audibleized, in ways that cannot be, um, that volume cannot be given to it in those secret ways, even in our weakness, when we don't know how to pray, when we are praying in the spirit, we are praying saying, Lord, I am too weak to even know the right way to pray but I ask you to pray on my behalf and praying in the spirit is an acknowledgement of Lord, you know, even when I don't know. And when I'm too weak, you are strong. As Paul said in second Corinthians chapter 12, though I am weak, I am strong because of the power of Christ that's perfected in me. And in that prayer, Paul says, um, Paul says the Lord told him over and over again, when he was praying, Lord, this is what I want. The Lord was saying, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And so when he was saying, this is what I want, he was still praying in the spirit in a way that he could he could acknowledge, Lord, but I know that what you want from me is better than what I want. So frequency in prayer, manner of prayer in the spirit, but also a posture of prayer, perseverance, perseverance rather, watchfulness. How do you watch and how do you stay alert? You watch and you stay alert by continuing to pray. Interesting enough, you know, one of the devil's tricks in getting us to lower our guards in this spiritual battle. And by the way, Ephesians 6 is all about warfare. And here this passage of prayer is tied to warfare. And so one of the ways that the devil gets us to lower our guards in battle is to get us to stop praying because we haven't seen God answer some of the prayers that we're praying. 
And so Paul says that you stay alert and watchful through perseverance, continuing to pray, not lowering your guards, but rather, as we talked about just a few few weeks ago, praying with a posture like the woman who is standing before the judge in the court in Luke 18, where she continues to come to the judge and continues to petition the court saying, grant me justice, grant me justice, grant me justice. God says if 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 a unrighteous judge is willing to be so bothered that he would grant a petition to the widow who continues to show up in his courtroom, then how much more so will a righteous judge hear those that are crying out to him day and night as well? And so we are we remain alert in this spiritual battle by not succumbing to the temp- or the temptations and tricks of the enemy that would tell us the Lord is not listening. So stop praying. And rather we say, no, he is, even when he's not answering the prayer in a manner that I think he should answer it, he's still answering prayer. And so I'm going to continue to seek his face and I'm going to continue to pray. And so frequency, manner, posture, but then notice the reach of prayer. Paul says in this passage that we are to pray and make intercession for all the saints. You know, the most important thing that I can do for those around me is pray for them. Now, it is not the only thing I can do for those around me, but it is unquestionably the most important thing I can do for those around me is pray for them. Um, you know, Charles Wesley, um, or John Wesley rather, um, he once mentions this idea that we should consider wrestling for others in prayer, the same way we wrestle in prayer for ourselves, that we should wrestle in prayer for others the same way that we wrestle in prayer for ourselves. That's a convicting statement for me because I know I can really travail and wrestle in prayer when it has something to do with my despair and my trials and my tribulations. But I can make some of the quickest and some of the most basic prayers possible when I am praying on behalf of others. But Wesley challenges us and says, are you praying for others in the same with the same vigor as you would pray for yourself? You know, Kiki Palmer, a celebrity movie star actress, has this joke that she was uh, sharing about the movie Titanic. She talks about, you know, this movie, The Titanic. Many of you have probably seen it where, um, of course, we know we know how this story ends. Right. And the Titanic is sinking and Rose and Jack, the romantic couple that meets on the Titanic, they are uh, sinking along with it. And then they find some of the debris um, that's out to sea. And Jack puts Rose on one of the pieces of the ship. So she can sit on the sit on that piece of the ship and remain warm and not die from the freezing temperatures until help help arrives. And Kiki Palmer says, interesting, uh, uh, interesting enough. Why didn't Rose just scoot over? I mean, she, she says she just sits there on this on this piece of ship and just watches her man just watches her man freeze to death. She said, why didn't she just scoot over just a little bit? Looks like there was more room on that piece of debris that she could have maybe scooted over and gave him a little room just to get, she said, maybe she, maybe they could even switch places every once in a while. And she could have gave him a 60 second break. And then she jumped back on the, on the piece of debris or something. But, but it's a, it's, it's a funny, it's a funny antidote, but it's very interesting because oftentimes I feel like I'm that person on the debris when it comes to prayer (laughs) that I, that I, that I make, that I, you know, stretch my legs out. And I made all kinds of room on that piece of debris when I pray for myself and that the poor soul that's out to sea, I have only, you know, very cute platitudes and and very, uh, very quick words before the Lord um, as they are out to sea with me rather than saying, OK, no, I'm going to scoot over and make room in my prayer life for Sherry Tynes and Patty Fultz and Nettie Winters. I'm going to make room in my prayer life and pray just as eagerly for their plights as I'm praying for my own. You know, Wesley says one of the reasons that possibly we don't have answers to our prayer is because we don't wrestle 
for others like we wrestle for ourselves. I find that deeply convicting. And so there's a posture and a reach and a manner and a frequency to prayer. But then lastly, there's a focus to prayer. Paul prays that that he might have the boldness to share the gospel, that doors and opportunities might be made available for him to share the gospel. Paul asked the saints to pray for him, but he asked the saints to pray for him. Interesting enough, while he's in prison, while he's in chains, he acknowledges he's, acknowledges he's in chains, but he asked them to pray that the gospel might go forward and that he might be a vessel for the gospel to go forward, even in the midst of his chains. He is not so much focused on his, his plight. He is not so much focused on his struggle. He is focused on the kingdom of God going forward, the mission of God advancing, and the people of God flourishing, not just through financials or uh, financial flourishing, but the but the people of God flourishing by the gospel advancing and lives being changed and destinations being altered and souls being set free from the bondages and chains of sin. And so I find that interesting that this man in prison is praying or asking that if you are to pray for me, pray that the gospel might go forward through me. And that's a challenge to me. And I pray it's a challenge to you that even, even in focusing on us, there's a way that we can focus on us that still puts the focus on God. Where we say, Lord, help me to make you known. And so whatever you need to do in me, whatever causes you need to advance in me, whatever, whatever strengthening that needs to happen in my life, whatever encouragement I need to receive, help me, help me advance your cause. Help me advance your mission. Strengthen me that the gospel might be made known through me. And so, yeah, sure, there is petitions that we can make that the Lord would bless our families and add, add, add a seed or add fruit to our seed and, and give us prosperity and, 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 and give us health. And, you know, we can pray these prayers, but none of those prayers should ever supersede this ultimate prayer that God would use us to make his name known in the world and that he would use us to make his name known to those around us. And so pray at all times, pray in the spirit, pray with perse perseverance, pray for the saints and pray that God would make his name known and pray that your default setting would become prayer.